to Speak the Word with Bible teacher Joanne Ramsey. Please join Pastor Ramsey now as she continues to teach God's soldiers how to wield the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Last night I began a message called Victory, Your Victory is in Your Mouth. And tonight I want to continue with God's soldiers are bold as a lion. We are bold as lions, right, saints? We are bold as lions. Proverbs 28, verse 1, reading from the voice translation, it says that the wicked run away even when no one is chasing them, but the right living, the righteous, however, he says, stands their ground as boldly as lions. Saints, I believe in order for you to have victory in your life, for you to have victory, I believe that you have to be bold, I believe you have to be confident, and I believe you have to be fearless. You know, the Lord tells us in 2 Timothy 1, 7, that He did not give us a spirit of fear, but He gave us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So we don't have to be fearful. In Proverbs 28, 1, He also says that the righteous are bold as a lion. The righteous in Proverbs 28 are contrasted with the wicked who flee, even though he says no one is pursuing them. In other words, they are afraid even when there is no reason to be afraid. But saints, the righteous, on the other hand, he says, are bold as a lion. Hallelujah. You know, I don't know a lot about lions, but what I do know, lions are not afraid to take on an impossible task they even attack animals that are even larger than themselves. I understand that they are courageous in the face of opposition. And that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be courageous in the face of opposition. We're not supposed to turn tail and run into other direction. And I, I, I'm standing up here saying there's been times that I've been tempted to turn tail and run into other direction. And I realize I'm not supposed to be the one that's leaving. The other one should be the one that's leaving, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Praise God. They will advance. I understand that they will advance and attack to protect their own. Saints, I remember many years ago when I was pregnant with my oldest daughter. When I was living out in uh, in uh, on, I was living on a uh, military base out in New Mexico. And I had two small sons at the time. They were really young. My oldest son, Jeff, was outside playing in the yard. And he had wandered off to the neighbor's house across the street. And I went looking for him. And just as I found him, I saw the neighbor hit him in the mouth with the screen door. It's like, you know, he was standing at the door and she just hit him. And he was only like three or four years old. And just hit him in the mouth with the screen door. And when I saw this woman hit my son you know, in the mouth, something rose up on the inside of me, almost like a killer instinct. And I started toward her, but she went inside and she locked the door. <laughs> and then somebody, of course, called the military police. Saints, I don't think I would have hit the lady, but I sure wanted to. I, I guess the line or the, the lioness came out in me and I just reacted. You know, I didn't even take into consideration that I was pregnant and that I could have been hurt. I just wanted to protect my son. And I believe that's what the lines he's talking about, you having that spirit of, and being bold as a line. I don't think as Christians that we should start fights. However, I do believe it's okay to defend and protect our loved ones. I don't think just because we're called Christians that that means that gives us the license to roll over and play dead. I think that we need to be bold as lions. You know, the Lord tells us in Deuteronomy 31, 6, He said to be brave and courageous and not be afraid or be in dread of them. So we're not supposed to be afraid of our enemy and we're not supposed to be in dread of our enemy, who, whoever they are. The Holy Spirit says in Proverbs 28, 1 again, that the righteous are bold as a lion. So when you are established in Christ's righteousness, you will manifest boldness. When you get established in His righteousness, you will, be, you will manifest boldness and you will be bold as a lion. And then your response, and when you become bold as a lion, and then your response to the enemy's condemnation and the enemy's accusations will be an automatic thing and be an unconscious thing. 
It will just be an automatic. In other words, when the devil comes to you, you will respond automatically by speaking God's word. It will just be an automatic thing. It's kind of like Jesus did when he told Satan. He says, it is written. You know, saints, remember that you are the one with the authority here, not Satan. You are also ambassadors in Christ. We are his ambassadors. We don't need to be running off someplace. And, you know, I was thinking about this one day. I said, you know, what we really need to do is you need to put a no trespass sign on your body and a no trespass sign on your children and on your finances. And you need to say to the devil, devil, this is not your territory. And you can't be trespassing on my body and you can't be trespassing on my finances either. I'm serious. We need to put a no trespassing sign He's not allowed. He really doesn't have the, he does not have the authority. So put you a no trespassing sign up there and tell him, hey, you're trespassing. A lot of times when I'm praying, I say, devil, you get off of me. You're trespassing. You have no right. You have, you, you, you know, you don't even have squatter's rights. You know, you out of here. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me, saints? Saints, where is that spirit of boldness that the Lord talks about? He says, bold as a lion. Isn't that what the word teaches us? He teaches us to be bold as a lion. And as a child of God, you need to be bold with your authority. You cannot be mealy mouth and expect results. So many of God's children are mealy mouth. And they just let the devil just have his way and just do whatever they want to do. But you've got to stop being mealy mouth. You've got to open up. You have to be bold. I pray every day, Lord, just give me that spirit of boldness. You know, sometimes I stand back there and I share this because a lot of pastors, maybe they don't like to talk about their weak moments, but I have a lot of weak moments and, and I have to fight the devil just like anybody else. I mean, I, he's on my property the same as he is his on you. And I mean, I've got to put him under my foot the same as you got to put him under your feet. Right. And, and there was times back there, you know, I, I'm back there praising worship and the devil's, he don't want me to focus on the praise and the worship music. He don't want me to focus on the message. He wants me, he wants me to count people. He wants me to become a David. And we all know what happened if we read the Bible, know what happened to David when he began to count the men. He lost. So we have to fight against this. And it's not an easy battle when you know that you know that you know you're where God wants you to be. It's not an easy battle. But it's one that you can win. Because you have all of heaven backing you up. You know, I was thinking about that today. You got all of heaven backing you up. It's kind of like in the police force and he goes out there and he holds his hands up. He, you know... He, he, just, he could be just a little old guy, but it doesn't matter. Everybody's going to stop. This on that rope's going to stop. He doesn't really have the power to stop you, but he's got the one behind him, and that's us. We've got the power of heaven on our side and backing us up. So we don't have to keep back. He don't have to keep backing us up into the corner. Are you hearing me? You have to be bold. Your tongue has the power. Your tongue has the power, whether you realize it or not, to birth things. And your tongue has the power to kill things. Are you listening to me? You can use your tongue to bring something closer to you. And you can use that very same tongue to drive it further away from you. And some of you probably experienced that. Just with the words coming out of your mouth, you can drive somebody away from you forever. Or just with the words coming, to your, uh, coming out of your mouth, you can endure them to you forever. It's really up to you. Just, just the words and the tonality of the words coming out of your mouth. Saints, even though your tongue is a small member of your body, according to James 3, it has a lot of power. And I'm not teaching on James 3. I had that in there and I deleted it. <laughs> I deleted a lot. I, I cut a lot of the message. I didn't want it to be too long. But according to James 3, it's kind of like the, the bit in the horse's mouth. And we're all familiar with that. Or the rudder on the ship. Even though it's just a, you know, just a small, uh, a huge ship and a small rudder, it turns it anyway. And that's what God, Jesus was referring to. You're, even though your tongue is a, a very small member, it can control you. And it does control you. It, it, you know, it will, it's, it's where you have success or failure. It's where you get, you, you're healed or you're not healed. It's where you have finances or you don't have finances. That's the key. Right here, we was talking about that last night, about, about, about the uh, pass key. This is your pass key right here. Don't forget it. But anyway, your faith-filled words will attract the attention of heaven's angels on your behalf, according to Psalms 103.20. He says he has his angels standing by to hearken to his word and to hasten to bring it about. 
So you have God's angels encamped around and about you according to the word of God. And they're there to take your words and do something with them. But let me say, there's always another side to the coin. While your, fear, while your fear-filled words draw the demons of hell to work against you. When you're speaking negative stuff and fear-filled words, you're drawing the demons of hell into your situation. So your words will determine whether or not God's angels are working for you or, or where demonic forces are working for you. It's really up to you. Everything is a choice. God gives a choice. He doesn't come down here and make you do anything. He loves you too much to do that. He wants everything you do to be a willing a thing from your heart and He wants it to be done out of obedience because you do love Him. And as Joy was playing that song tonight, that was one of my favorites. I listen to it almost every morning. I probably could say every morning uh, before I do anything. And have my, that's one of my worship songs in the mornings. Just love Jesus. Just love Him so much. I changed a few of the words. <laughs> Not because He first loved me, but because, you know, just changed a couple of them. But uh, it's... You just get in that right frame of mind in the mornings before you begin your day, and it, you'll be just amazed how the rest of your day. It just you, that doesn't mean you're not going to run into some obstacles, but you're going to have a better day if you start it on the right track. Several years ago, the Lord gave me an analogy that is still with me today, and I want you to listen to this because there it is so profound. He gave me this many years ago, and he brought it back to my remembrance. He likened his word to silent movies of old. Saints, I know it's hard tonight to even think about with all this modern technology around us that actually there was a time when there was no voice in the movies. And most of them, and they were all in black and white. I started to say most, but they were all in black and white and they had no voice. You know, I can sit in my living room right now and I can watch a movie on a large screen TV that's filled with color and voices. I can talk on my phone every day and it talks back to me. As a matter of fact, I don't know what I would do without Siri. <laughs> Siri is the best paid employee I have. You know, she, uh, she reminds me all day long of things I need to do or should do or she, she, you know, or how to get from one place to another. She even spells words I have trouble with. I just punch it and say, Siri, how do you spell responsibility? R E. You know, it's so much faster than going to the dictionary anymore. You push a button. We're living in a push a button world, you know, and, and it's, it's amazing. And like I said, it's hard to imagine in the world that we're living in now with all the technology that all this, you know, hasn't really been that many years ago. It seems to like it, it seems like it has, but it hasn't. You know, that actually a lot of the technology that we have now has been in the last 10 years. Uh, a lot of the, most of it, the biggest parts of it. But it wasn't always that way, the Lord reminded me. The Lord said that the secular world has gotten very proficient at putting voices to movies as well as to many other devices, you know, like my iPhone. He said, however, and just listen to this, Jesus says that Christians have not even scratched the surface when it comes to giving voice to his word. And I put a sailor there. Sailor just means to pause and think about what he just said. God said that Christians have not even scratched the surface when it comes to giving voice to his word. And I'm sure that includes me too. You know, and I speak his word every day. Every day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Just calling them things that be not as though they are. And I haven't even scratched the surface. And, and I don't even know if I did it all day long, if I'd even scratched the surface. But he said, we haven't even scratched the surface. Saints, you activate the power of God's word when you open your mouth and you speak his word over your situations or to your mountains. You activate the enemy the very same way. And a lot of people don't understand that. You activate the enemy the very same way when you speak other than what the word of God says and you speak the, what the enemy says, you're activating him. You're, you're giving him access. You know, one of my favorite verses about the power of the tongue is found over in Proverbs 18. In Proverbs 18, 20, it says, A man's moral self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth and with the consequences of his words. He says he must be satisfied, he said, whether it's good or evil. And according to Hebrews 1, 3, it says that God upholds 
guides and propels the universe by his mighty word of power. Hallelujah. You know, God created us in his image, saints, and he has given you and me the power and the ability to frame our worlds with our words, his words. Just think about that for a second. Saints, you have actually been given the ability to change things with your words. You can really actually change things. I had a testimony today when I can't got time to get into it that a man called a testimony about how he spoke to the storm and stuff and how he'd been listening. He said, I'm way back in the 70s, you know, with the Kenneth Copelands and the Hagans. And, and, and he says, and they're all talking about this. He said, I never got it. He said, but I've been listening to you. And he said, what long ago, you know, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, he said, I finally got it. He says, kind of like the light bulb went on in his head, you know, and that he actually could speak to things. He had the power to actually speak. And he says, I've begun to speak. <laughs> and he says, it, and it really does. It really makes a big difference. But you do. You have the ability to change your seasons and you have the ability to change your circumstances just by the words that you choose to speak. That's powerful, I think. You know, do you know what that means? That means that you have the ability to determine how soon you get that raise. It has you have, gives you the ability to determine how you quick you're going to get that promotion. Or you can just keep your mouth shut, like I said before, and let things just happen on their own. And more than likely, you'll stay right where you are. Are you hearing me? You can keep silent and you can let the devil keep putting stuff on you. It's really up to you. But remember what the Lord said in Deuteronomy 30, 19. Today, he says, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, he said that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. In verse 20, he says, you, make this, you can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, he is saying that he has given you a choice, saints. He says you can choose. Or you, he says you can choose life or you can choose death. It's your choice. You get to choose. In other words, you can speed up your recovery if you're sick just by the choice of your words. You can choose to speak words of life or death. You know, God said his words are medicine to all your flesh, all your flesh. Hallelujah. In Proverbs 4.20, he says, my children, he says, pay attention to what I say and listen carefully to my words. He says, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. You know, healing, he's talking about healing to the flesh here, but there's also a healing in your finances. There's healing it can be in your finance. You might not need a healing in your body. You might need a healing in your finances. But it's, it's still both, both a healing. And saints, you choose life when you choose to agree with what God says about you. It's just that simple. The choice is yours. You get to choose. It's kind of like that game show. I was thinking about that when I was doing this message. It's kind of like that game show. You know, you get to pick which door. I don't know if you're, any of you ever watched that program. You know, they had three doors behind door number one, number two, number three. And a lot of times they didn't get the right door. But that, our life, I thank God, is not quite like the three doors. <laughs> but we do get a choice. We can choose life or we could choose death. It's like I told him last night. It's not what someone else says about you that will ever defeat you, but what you say about you. And I'm talking about what you're... What, I'm talking about when you're speaking God's word over yourself or your situation, not what the enemy says about you. And I want you to go, if you've got your Bibles, to go over with me to 2 Kings. We're going to go into 2 Kings, and New Living Translation. I'm going to read some verses to you out of uh, chapter 8. It says, in Eli we're talking about Elijah and the woman from uh, Shunem. It says, one day Elijah went to, went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, it says that whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. And we know that, you know, she said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops up, 
stops from time to time, is a holy man of God. So she says, let's build a small room from him on the roof. And we know that he built a small room. So we'll go on down 11. And it says, so one day Elijah returned to shoot him. And he went up to the upper room to rest. And he said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shudim, I want to speak to her. And when she appeared, Elijah said to Gehazi, tell her that we appreciate the kind concern that you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put you in a can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? And she replied, No, she replied, My family takes good care of me. Later Elijah asked Gehazi, What can we do for her? And Gehazi Gehazi replied, She doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elijah told him. And when the woman returned, Elijah said to her as he stood in the doorway, Next year at at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. O man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at the time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elijah had said. In verse 18, it says, One day when the child was older, he went out to help his father who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried out, My head hurts, my head hurts. And it says his father said to one of the servants, Carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home, and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, it says that he died. And it says in in 21, She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband. She sent one of, uh, one of the, uh, to send one of the servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and write back. Why go today, he asked. It is neither a new moon festival nor Sabbath. But she said, it will be all right. But she saddled the donkey and she said to the servant, she says, hurry. She says, don't slow down unless I tell you to. And it says, as she approached a man of God at Mount Carmel, Elijah saw her in the distance. And he said to Gehazi, look, the woman from Shuna is coming. Shuna is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her. He, he had to have had her to ask her three questions. He said, ask her, is everything all right with you, your husband and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God at the, at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi began to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled. But the Lord had not told, had not told Elijah what, what was going on. Then she said, did I, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? And then Elijah said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. He said, go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elijah returned home. Gehazi hurried hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He turned to meet Elijah, and he told him, The child is dead. When Elijah arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. He said, And then he laid down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. So it says that in verse 35 that Elijah got up, walked back and forth across the room once and then stretched himself out again on the child. And this time it says that the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. And it says, And then Elijah summoned Gehazi, Call the child's mother, he said. And when he came in, Elijah said, Here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. And then she took her son in her arms and she carried him and she carried him downstairs. Saints, I want you to keep in mind, I know it was a lot of verses, but keep in mind that the Shudamite woman didn't run to get advice from her friends when her son died. You know, we read the story, did, and nowhere in here did it say that she ran, she got called to anybody or run to any of her friends to tell them what had happened. In other words, she kept her mouth shut. 
And even when her husband asked her where she was going, all she told him was, it's all right. All she said was, it'll be all right. It says that when Elijah saw her approaching, he sent his servant to find out what she wanted. Elijah told his servant to ask her three questions in verse 26. The first question he wanted her to ask, he says, is it well with you? And the second question was, is it well with your husband? And the third question he asked him, he says, is it well with your son? To all these questions, notice that her answer was, it is well. Saints, you know better than that. And I know better than that. You know from the scriptures that I just read that things were far from being all right. They were not all right. Her son had just died. And I'm sure that she was experiencing a lot of painful emotions. She's dealing with her son that's dead. But yet, she said everything's okay. She probably felt like screaming and crying. However, she didn't speak her situation. She did not give in to her feelings. And you, you have to imagine that would be a terrible thing for someone you love, whether it's your child or your spouse or someone, anybody, that they're died and you've got to hang on to your emotions and on to your feelings. I know of people, I've heard of stories of uh, because of somebody were a, that was able to do this that the people have actually been raised back from the dead. Just not give in to your emotions and your feelings, but just trust the Lord. Just keep hanging on to every word he says. But she didn't speak her situation, and she did not give in to her feelings. She did not allow her emotions to take over. She kept, kept quiet. You know, sometimes, saints, and I want you to hear me, sometimes the best warfare that you can do is just to keep your mouth shut. Just keep your mouth shut and only talk to the Lord about your situation. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes your best warfare is just to keep your mouth shut and just talk to God about it. Because you know, we both know that He's the only one that can really help us. There's nobody else, really. In most of our situations, there's some, you know, people can do a few things for you. But in most situations, the only one that can really help you is God. And even in the little things, He's working through them. He's, he's always the one that's the, your answer. He's always the answer. And it says that she was upset with the prophet Elijah. And she said to him in verse 28, she says, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Do not get my hopes up? Saints, she felt like that Elijah had deceived her. She had not asked for a son. However, uh, the prophet Elijah just wanted to return her kindness. You know, he thought that was a good thing. He just wanted to do something good for her. And I'm sure that Elijah must have been feeling some kind of emotions himself. I mean, I'm sure he wasn't motion, uh, emotionless, you know, because here he has um, prophesied uh, about this son. She has this son, and a few years later, you know, he dies, and so she comes to him. She didn't go to the neighbors. She went to the, to the man of God. That's where she went. And, and then she told him earlier in there, and she says, in, uh, when she was leaving, she says, I'm not going nowhere unless you go with me. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> She's going to be stubborn. Hallelujah. And I'm sure, like I said, that Elijah must have been feeling some kind of emotions too because he had told his servant to leave her alone for her soul was vexed within her. You know, saints, when someone is vexed, it means that they're tormented. It means that they're troubled. It means that they're distressed and they're irritable. You know, and he, he's told him, he said, just, you know, leave her alone. He said, her soul is vexed. And the word says that the Lord had not told Elijah that her son had died. As a matter of fact, Elijah was acting out and helping her, but he, God had not even informed Elijah that her son was dead. So he didn't really even know what was going on when she was coming after him. And it says here that another thing Elijah told his servant to do, and I want you to listen to this, he told him if he met anybody for him not to salute him. He said, even if he salutes you, you don't salute back. You remember there? He said, you just go. Don't salute anybody on the way. And if they salute you, don't salute them back. He just keep on going. Saints, why do you think Elijah told his servant that? Why do you think Elijah told his servant, don't, don't, if they salute you, 
Don't salute anybody. If they salute you, don't salute them back. I think he told him that because he didn't want him to stop and start talking and gossiping to somebody about the situation. You'll be surprised at how much damage is done with his mouth and, and how many miracles that you have talked yourself out of that you could have had if, if you could have just controlled the tongue just for a little while. I know it's hard. You know, it's like that, you know, that day when that lady hit my son in the mouth with the door, it was hard. And I, I don't really think I would have hit her, but she think, she probably thought I was. She locked the door. She, <laughs> but anyway, like I said, I think that he told him that because he didn't want him to stop got to, and start talking and gossiping to somebody about the situation. Elijah didn't want him to say something that would hinder his prayers. I have asked people, I pay, occasionally I'll ask somebody to pray for me, but I'm very selective about who I have lay hands on me. I'm very selective about who I ask to pray for me. And a very couple of people, and when I do, I always ask them, don't say anything. Don't share this with anybody. Because I want it. I want it. You know, I want it. I'm trusting you to come into agreement with me, and I'm trusting you to keep your mouth shut because I know the danger of all that stuff going out into the supernatural. And I know all the demonic forces around that can stop what I'm praying for. And so I don't want them telling anybody. Sometimes, you know, and, and, and I don't know if I should say this, but I will, you know, sometimes people, you know, they think that more people to get to pray for them, the better. But that's not true. All you need is either pray yourself or one spirit-filled person that will agree with you in prayer and that will just keep it that way, just between the two of you. That's really all you need. As a matter of fact, you danger your, you endanger your answer and your miracle when you, everybody pray for me. Honey, everybody is not in line with you. Everybody don't share your faith. Everybody don't pray according to the Word of God. The, pr the wrong prayers can damage you. They can harm you if you're not praying. If you don't pray in, uh, based on the Word of God, you got to pray based on His Word. Like I just said, you can't go run into everybody and start talking to them about your situation because everybody will not be in agreement with you. I can promise you that they won't, and they will not all share your faith either. Are you hearing me? In verse 34 and 35, says that Elijah went in and stretched himself upon the boy and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his head. And, and when Elijah did this, the boy's body became warm and, and he gave him back to him. And the second time, it says that it, it didn't do it the first time, but I think we just read that and um, must have put it in there twice. But anyway, Elijah called his servant and said, call this Shudamite woman. And said so he called her. And when she came, Elijah said, take up your son. And after bowing herself to the ground, she took her son and she left. Saints, I truly believe that if the Shudamite woman had opened her mouth and allowed the enemy to get in, I believe she would have experienced a totally different outcome. There is no other reason why that it would be put in there that she kept her mouth shut if it had not if it did not have some effect on her outcome she didn't tell she didn't even tell her husband she told him it was all right everything was all right kids all right i'm all right husband's okay everything's okay do you know i can't express to you enough, the importance of you guarding your mouths, your words when you're in a trial or even when you're in prayer about something so that the enemy can't get you into agreement with him and stop your breakthrough because he would love so much to stop your breakthrough. And that's all he needs is just one word. You need to be confessing victory even in the face of defeat. Even when it looks like nothing has happened, you still have to continue to confess victory. That's what the Shudamite woman did. That's what she chose to do. As I was just saying, I'll go back up there and say, 
and pick that up again where it says that you need to be confessed in victory even in the face of defeat, even when it looks like nothing's working because a lot of times you're praying for something and in the natural it looks like nothing at all is working at all. But that's what the Shudamite woman chose to do. And, and you're going to have to do the same thing, saints, if you want to experience the same victory that she experienced. We're going to have to do the same thing. You may not realize this, but you really can move mountains with your mouth. And it tells us that in Mark 11:23. But saints, one of the points I'd like to make here is that you have been given the ability to change the outcome of things through your words. Now, the Shudamite woman was apparently not having a very good day, but she kept her mouth shut and only spoke to the person who could help her. And the Bible says she gained a surpassing victory in doing so. Hallelujah. Think about that. When you're in a trial, who do you talk to? Saints, you must realize that your mouth is what gives life to the word. And when you speak the word, the Lord has his angels standing by to hearken to his word, as I said earlier. And he also says that he himself is active and alert and that he's watching over his word to perform it, according to Jeremiah 1.12. I realize that it's not easy for you to ignore those things going on around you. I know it's not easy to ignore your body when you're sick. I know it's not easy for you to ignore those bills when you don't have the money to pay them. I know from my own personal experiences that none of these things are easy. I've been there when my body was sick and, and I'm believing for healing and I've been broke and busted and disgusted and, and believe in the Lord for a financial breakthrough. So I, I've been I've been in all of those places. So you, you just can't come up if you've never experienced something. If I've always been being fed with a silver spoon, maybe I wouldn't understand this, but that hasn't always been the case. You know, the enemy stuck in and, 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 and stole my mate, um, stole my house, my money, he, you know, tried to steal my health. But you, you, you just gotta, you gotta keep on fighting. You, you just gotta stand and you gotta keep on fighting because there is an answer. And God, you know, as long as you're standing, you're winning. Whether you're seeing anything going on in the natural or not, as long as you're standing, you're winning. You know, God has promised you that His Word will accomplish what He sends it out to do, He says, and it will not return unto Him void, He says in Isaiah 55, 11. But it will accomplish and prosper the thing for which to He sends it. You know, God says He framed the world with His words according to Hebrews eleven three. It says, Through faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, and everything that we now see was fashioned from that which is invisible. You know, what is God telling you here, saints? He is simply saying that just as He called, just as God Himself called those things that be not as though they were, He says, so must you. In Romans four seventeen, He is saying that everything, everything that was made, came from something that was invisible before it became visible. And I realize that sounds a little strange to you. Abraham thought it sounded a little strange to him too when God told him that not only was he going to be the father of many nations, he said, but he was going to bless Sarah and she would become the mother of many nations. He told, he said, kings of people shall come from her, God said in Genesis 17. You know, and when God told Abraham this, you know, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And said in his heart, shall, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a son? And God said to Abraham, And God said to Abraham, Your wife Sarah shall bear a son indeed, and you shall call his name Isaac, which means laughter. You know, God knew what Abraham was thinking in his heart. He knows what you're thinking in your heart. You know, when God tells you that you can do something, I, you know, when the Lord put this ministry into my spirit, actually when I was still in the other ministry, I could have laughed. I really could have because I'm telling he's telling me to do something for number one that I've not been educated to do, don't have the source to do, don't know what to do. But he's telling me I'm going to do it. He was telling, you know, I wasn't a hundred and pregnant. <laughs> but I was pregnant. God, put, he makes you pregnant with things. He puts things in your spirit. You become pregnant with whatever that vision and that thing that he puts in your spirit. You know, it, it, it's different things. 
and mine was the ministry, you know. And then as, as it went on, you know, just like when he wanted me to be the chaplain, you know, I had no training. I was the only chaplain in North Carolina that became the chaplain, no training. But like I said, God's on your side. He's for you, with you, in you, all around you. And if he says you're going to do something, you're going to do it. All, if, if you were willing. He didn't force me. And I was tempted not to even ask, you know, because he, he put that in my spirit six months and then another three months and another three months. And one day I was just happened to be sitting in the superintendent's office because warden's office because at that time I was the president of the community resource council and doing some other things with them and uh, ministering out there uh, been ministering out there for a few years and and I was sitting there one day and the Lord spoke to me so plain he said ask him and I thought ask him what <laughs> and and I, so he, he wanted me to ask him you know and so I, I turned around to him and I asked him um, I, I said, uh, Mr. Outlaw, I said, uh, what, if somebody wanted to be at a chaplain out here, because we had a chaplain when I went working out there, but that had been, he'd been gone for like five years and states weren't, you know, they weren't going to bring anybody else in, you know, and, um, uh, and so the Lord had been out to me for the last year or so to do, to take the position. And, uh, I figured I must've misheard him, you know, because I, I just think I could do that. But, and I said, well, if somebody wanted to be the chaplain out here, what would they have to do to do it? And he said, well, Reverend Barnhart, are you saying you like to be the chaplain? <laughs> I said, I reckon I am. <laughs> and I think that was in June and August I was a chaplain. You know, the, the letter started shooting back and forth from there to Raleigh, you know. And the next thing you know, I got the phone call. But you know, the very morning that I got the phone call. Uh, I didn't know I had the phone call. It was on my answer machine. Uh, I hadn't checked my messages. But that very morning, I was in the bathroom getting dressed to go to work, wherever I was, you know, I was ministering at the jail and prison, so I must have been going to minister. That, but that very morning, the devil was in, in telling me, because he'd been telling me this the whole time, would you think you really are qualified to do that? And I'm thinking, no, he's got a point. No, you know, and and you really think that people in Raleigh gonna let you, you know, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna do this, and and he was just going, going on, and finally I just opened my mouth and I said, yes, Lord said I'm gonna be, I'll be, right. you know, I don't know how I'm going to be, but if he says I'm going to be, I'm going to be, and that, as far as I'm concerned, that settles it. And I went in a few minutes later and checked my messages, and the uh, program's director had left me a message and said, well. Ms. Barnhart, I just want to let you know we got the letter back from Raleigh and you're our new chaplain. When can you start? <laughs> you know, but the devil, if you let him, he'll just eat your lunch and pop the bag. You know, <laughs> hallelujah. You just, you got to keep him off your shoulders. Let me finish up here. He also, like I said, he also knew that Sarah had laughed too because she had overheard the Lord talking to Abraham, and she denied, of course, that she laughed. But God said, oh, no, but you did laugh. He said, I heard you. You know, and he says, and then God said in, uh, in Genesis 18, he says, it is anything too wonderful or too hard or wonderful for the Lord? And, you know, I like to ask you that same question. Is anything too hard or too wonderful for the Lord? I don't think so. I think the answer to that is no. And Luke 1, and Luke 1 verse 37 says, would with God, nothing is ever impossible, and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. Saints, one thing I've learned to do, as I should say, I'm learning to do because I've not arrived yet. I'm still learning the same way. I'm still a student. I'm still learning the same as you. But I've learned that when I've been going through something, I need to start bringing back to my remembrance some of my past victories, and I need to start doing it right away. The sooner you start bringing back to your remembrance past victories, the happier you're going to be and the sooner you're going to get it. You know, I did this just recently when I had to have an ultrasound on my thyroid and I was at the doctor's and as I was lying there and the nurse was doing the ultrasound on me, I kept remembering back. The Lord kept putting back. He, uh, the Lord brought back to my remembrance uh, a time in 1993. I actually was over here in Hampton. 
uh, when I was living here when I had a cyst on my ovary and they were going to operate on me. But they couldn't operate right away because I had uh, some seminars coming up because before I became a preacher, I did other things. And uh, <laughs> you know, I was teaching solar, color psychology, as a matter of fact. And, uh, and so I couldn't, I couldn't have it right away. And so they scheduled the surgery. So I went back in um, uh, to when I could do it a few weeks later. And so they was doing a, a pre-op on me. And so they wanted to do some more uh, ultrasounds on me. And so the first time they did it, they gave me the picture of it, you know, and I had the picture of it all on, you know, pretty little picture. And, and so then I went back and, and I noticed he looked, he, and next thing I know, he brought in a couple of nurses, you know, and they were looking, you know, and, and there was nothing there. So I had two pictures. I had one with something and one without something. Hallelujah. You know, God just, and it's gone, no surgery, you know. <laughs> but, you know, so I, I said to the Lord, I don't believe, as I was laying there, the Lord brought this, put this into my mind. And he wanted me to focus on that. So I don't believe, you know, so I said, Lord, I don't believe that they're going to find anything this time either. I, I think, Lord, that I said, you are my healer and I have received you as my healer. So I just began to lay there and praise the Lord for my healing, you know, because I'm focusing on this. I'm not focusing on what they're doing. I'm just focusing on what the Lord had given me. And that's really what David did, you know, over, uh, he told King Saul, uh, he said, your servant, he says, uh, kept his father's sheep. And when they, there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, David said, I went after it and I smote it and I delivered the lamb out of its mouth. And he said, when it rose again, he said, I caught it by its beard and I smote it and I killed it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he's, are you hearing me? And he says, your servant killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be just like one of them. Hallelujah. You know, when you recall your past victories, it makes you bolder and it makes you stronger. That's the purpose of recalling your past victories. God's word is infused. It's engrafted into you. And by giving voice to his word with your own mouth, you can and will change your immune system for the better or for the worst. I wish I could get that across to people. I know from my own personal experiences that it's true, you know, because I, like I said, I've told this so many times before and I'm going to pass right on by most of that. But at one time I was taking over 150 pills a month, you know, and now I'm down to one. And, and uh, actually I was down to nothing. I went to, from 150 to nothing. And the last year I had some problems with my stomach, so I had to take one for that. But I'm working on that just because, you know, he told me that I would probably have to always take that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. You know, there's power in speaking what God says. I know I must sound like a broken record to a lot of people because the people that listen to me on the radio and the people that come to uh, my face-to-face uh, -face conferences and meetings, uh, I preach the word, teach the word, speak the word, speak the word, speak the word. It sounds like a broken record. But you know, I'm going to keep right on doing that because that was my assignment to teach people how to wield the sword of the Spirit, how to take authority over their circumstances by using God's Word. And I'm just going to keep on doing it. And, and, I'm going, and I'm going to keep on doing it until I know that you got it. And you're going to say, well, when, are you, when do you know when we got it or not? I'm going to know that you got it when I start getting more praise reports. When I start getting more praise reports, then I know you got it. And then we're going to move on. <laughs> remember what the word tells you in Job twenty two twenty eight, and we're coming to an end he said you shall decide and decree a thing and it shall be established for you and the light of God's favor shall shine upon your ways well you are the ones that shall decide and decree you decide and decree that you're not going to be sick anymore you decide and decree that this is going to be the year of an overflow harvest in every area of your life. If you need a job, this is going to be the job, year that you're going to find it. It's going to be the best job you've ever had, making more than you've ever made with the better benefits than you've ever had. You're going to decide and decree. You decide and decree that you're going to take action. God said when you do, he's going to establish it. You decide and decree, he says, and that's what his word says, right? Saints, God is not a respecter of persons. 
Favor is not a respecter of persons either. Favor is a respecter of obedience. That's what favor is a respecter of obedience. I decided a long time ago that I was not going to stay where I was at at the time. I began to speak over my body. I began to speak over my debts. I began to pray and write down what the Lord spoke to me. And then I would confess it until I had victory in that area. Now, some things I, I've told people, confessing took some, some of them took days, some took months, some took years. And I have actually had prayers answered while I was still asking. I've had people knock on the door before I even said amen. So it, it, it just depends, you know. Sometimes, you know, it takes a little while. Sometimes it takes a little while. But I made a decision. That's what you have to do tonight, saints. You have to make a decision. I made a decision that it did not matter how long it took me. I was going to continue until I had victory in that particular situation. I didn't care how long it was going to take me. I had made that decision that I'm going to stand. Today I'm debt free and I'm healthy in my body. And as I close, I want to encourage you to learn to release your faith through the words. And Jesus says, as thou have believed, so be it done. He didn't say, as I said one time, that it would only work if you believed right. Whether you believe right or wrong, it is still the law. Your heart will manifest what you put in it. The Bible likens your heart to soil, okay? And God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Like I said, your heart is likened to a soil. So whatever you put in it, that's what it's going to grow. You, you, you know, it doesn't it determine. The soil does not determine what it grows. You determine what it grows by what you put in it. The words you speak are seeds that will produce after their own kind. So just as sure as they are planted, you can be equally sure that you're going to have a harvest regardless. Saints, make sure that you're sowing what you want to harvest. Because think of it this way. I said this, I might have said somebody to this tonight. Make sure that the words that you're speaking, because you're going to get a harvest, your words are seeds. Every word that comes out of your mouth is a seed. So just think of it that when you're, you can be doing one of two things. You could be confessing God's word and, con, you know, over your situation. And, and, you, and as you're confessing those words, it, it's like seeds are sprouting out of you, pouring out of your mouth. It's just spewing, you're just spewing those seeds everywhere by confessing. But also if you're speaking the opposite, you're also Get, that's where you know you're going to get the crabgrass and you're going to get all this other stuff that you didn't want. And, and you're going to say, oh, Pastor Joe, I prayed, you know, for apples. And, you know, I went out and I got oranges. Well, you didn't pray for apples. <laughs> you know, uh, it, you, you pray, you're going to get, you're going to get what you pray for. And, you know, I get some really, uh, I get a lot of prayer requests on the phone as, as well as emails. And this was an email. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But, you know, sometimes... I. I wonder about people um, and they ask for certain prayers and I think, Lord, how can I pray for, for this? I, you know, some of this stuff, I, I, you know, I, I guess I could pray for some of that. But in one part of it down there, she was asking me, to, this lady, um, she's asked for prayer before um, and I've, I've sent her prayers, you know, we prayed with her and I've sent her stuff. And uh, so I was praying for the rest of them, and I get down to the part there, and she says, um, she just wants her family to have roots, and da-da-da. And she says, and also, and the very bottom, she says, also, she said, Play, pray for my son, Raji. He fell 20 feet off a roof two years ago, had to go for independent medical exam yesterday. Prayer that he is still permanently disabled, which he is. She said, which he is. So she wants me to pray. You know, he was disabled two years ago because he fell 20 feet from a roof and he got disabled. And so now apparently he's getting some type of disability. And so he's going now back, you know, for a, a medical exam. And would I pray that he is still permanently disabled? Now, I'm not going to pray to God that he remain, that he be, and I say, Lord, make sure that he's permanently disabled. You know, I mean, you just don't pray prayers like that. 
But you know, sometimes, the, my point is, is that when I was talking about the prayers that we pray sometimes can hurt us. You know, you know, she needs, you know, she could have asked me to pray for a healing or somebody else to pray for a healing. Now, that's, that's God's business. You know, the devil is the one that's in the business of keeping you crippled. God, he's the one that's in the business of healing your body. Amen. You know, Jesus it wasn't wounded, you know, and, and beaten for him, him to be crippled. He was wounded and beaten for him to get up and walk and run around the room. You know, so it's just be careful, you know, what you ask for and when you pray. But like I said, I get a, a, a lot of, you know, such prayers like that, that I just, it just blows me away. You know, how, Lord, how am I going to handle this? You know, so I pray for that part. And then what I do is I just tell them the truth. That, that's not, that I don't, I just deal with the truth. You know, I, I'll, you know, I'll pray with them. And I'll send them back and I'll say, well, uh, I, what I'll do, I haven't answered that prayer yet. But I'll talk to the Lord about it, and He'll tell me exactly what to tell her. But that's not it. But it's just like, you know, the Lord says that His words are always followed by signs and wonders, you know. And it's like you came in here tonight hungry, I believe, to be fed, to hear what God has to say to you. But He's also is always in the business to answer in prayers and work in miracles. So, but in order for this to take place, you first have to believe it. So you can't come forth and ask for prayer without having faith that you're going to receive it. Because if you have doubts about receiving it, you'll be wasting your time and my time and God's time. But if you have a situation, I'm going to pray and we're going to close. And if you need prayer, and if you really feel like that Jesus is going to hear us, I can't heal you. But the one inside of me that works through me can and so he, he's the healer, and he can heal you, you know. And if you have faith in his name, as the Bible says in Acts, that he was healed because he had faith in the name of Jesus. He had faith in that name. You don't have faith in Pastor Joe. I can't help you, but Jesus can. He's the healer, and, he's gonna, and he, can, he works through me and any others that he works with. He works through us. Father, I thank you so much for this word tonight. I thank you, Lord, for all the sheep that came, and I pray for all those that didn't come. But, Lord, I thank you that you were here and that you are still here. Lord, I thank you for your presence among us. I thank you, Lord, that you have manifested your presence among us, Lord. And I just thank you that you're here, willing and able to, to answer prayers, to heal bodies, or whatever they need, Lord, even if it's a spare part. I thank you, Lord, that you have, you have ample supply of whatever anybody in this room needs and that you're more than able and willing to meet them. All they have to do, Father, is just ask in faith and receive it. So, Lord, I thank you tonight for this word. I pray, Lord, that the, that the saints were fed, fed well tonight as you have authorized me to do, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that they're well on their way to becoming the warriors that you're wanting to be. And Father, again, we just thank you for this word, and I pray traveling graces for all those that came. In Jesus' name, I give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen.